Basic Ecomistics. Statistics is the science of using a random sample to infer properties of a population. In this video, I'll talk more about the random sample and the population. Let's get started. For example, suppose that I'm interested in studying the students in an econometrics class. In particular, I want to learn if they get better grades if they study more. The population that I'm studying are the students in the class. Suppose there are only three students in the class, Alice, Ben and Carl. Let me gather everyone in my population in one set. I'll call this set Omega. This may seem like an odd choice. After all, didn't we use Omega to denote a sample space? We will see later that the population is closely related to a certain sample space. So closely related, in fact, that you may as well think of the population as a sample space. For now, let's focus on how the population is different from a sample space. A sample space represents uncertainty. It is a collection of different possibilities that may or may not come to pass. The way we think about uncertainty has a certain dynamic quality, where one of the many possibilities becomes real. In contrast, a population is completely static. All entities in the population are there the whole time. They are real and not just possibilities. I want to study the population and uncover a relationship between study time and exam scores. To do that, I have to have a way of describing features of my population. One of the features I have to describe is certainly the exam scores of everyone in my population. I can do this by using a function that to every entity in the population assigns a number that I interpret as the exam score of this individual. Let's look at some person small omega in my population. Evaluated at small omega, the function y gives the exam score of individual omega. For example, if Alice has achieved 86 points on the exam, then y of Alice is 86. Note that y is very similar to a random variable. In fact, the only thing that distinguishes y from a random variable is that we have a different interpretation of the space on which it is defined, capital omega. Let's define more functions that describe the population. x1 tells us how many hours a person has studied. For example, if omega is Alice and if Alice has studied 19 hours, then x1 of Alice is 19. x2 tells us how many statistics courses someone has taken before they enrolled in the econometrics course. Since econometrics builds on concepts from statistics, Someone who already knows a lot of statistics will have a leg up and won't have to study as much to get a good grade. If Alice has already taken two statistics courses, then x2 of Alice will be 2. Let's continue carrying over concepts from probability theory to describe our population. It turns out that it is very useful to have an analog of the probability function p. For small omega in the population, let p of omega denote the proportion of the population that is made up of omega. In our example, Alice represents one-third of the population, therefore p of Alice is one-third. If you take our definition of the population as consisting of three actual people literally, then p doesn't seem very useful. It only repeats information that is already obvious. P does become useful if we stop taking our definition of the population so literal and treat it more metaphorically. For this, we stop thinking of Alice as an actual person. Instead, we think of her as representing several people that are like her. What is the proportion of people in the population that are like Alice? It doesn't have to be one third. It could also be, for example, 21%. Next, we will establish a relationship between our population and the outcome of a certain random experiment. This will also make it clear why I reuse concepts from probability theory to describe my population. The random experiment that we are looking at is drawing a sample of size n equal 1 from our population. What are the possible samples that we may draw? 
we may draw Alice, Ben, or Carl. The set of all possible samples is the sample space. To describe, for example, the exam score of the randomly sampled student, we can use a random variable. Let's call this random variable y. For each possible sample, small omega, y gives the exam score of the one student that we sampled. For example, if we sample Alice, then y of the sample Alice will be 86. What is the probability of drawing Alice? Or in our metaphorical interpretation of the population, what is the probability of drawing someone like Alice? Since we are drawing completely at random, the probability of drawing someone like Alice is equal to the fraction of individuals in the population that are like Alice. In our example, that is 21%. This shows that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between our population and the random experiment of drawing once from the population. This is very useful to us. Remember that most of the time it is impossible to look at the whole population. While we may not be able to look at the population, we may be able to draw a sample from it. Looking at the population or looking at a random sample of size 1 are, at least in a probabilistic way, equivalent. This insight forms the basis of statistics. Another way to express the same idea is to say that the sample probabilistically represents the population. We say our sample is a representative sample. Sampling completely at random ensures that our sample is representative. To study an empirical research question, I rarely have to know all of the facets of a population. To investigate the relationship between study time and exam scores, I probably don't have to know that Alice plays basketball or that Ben loves Game of Thrones. To describe the features of the population that are relevant to my research question, I can use random variables. Suppose that my research question can be adequately addressed by considering three variables. Y gives the exam score of a student, X1 gives the number of hours studied, and X2 tells me how many statistics courses the student has already taken before starting the econometrics course. As we already discussed, Y, X1 and X2 also describe a random sample of size 1. In statistics, the only relevant property of a population is how it produces samples. This leads us to a more abstract definition of a population. We define a population to be something that we can draw samples from and where the samples can be described by random variables. In our case here, by random variables y, x1 and x2. We then say that the joint distribution of the random variables is the population. In econometrics, the population is also often called the data generating process, or DGP. This emphasizes the fact that, by way of giving us samples, the population is generating the data that we are working with. This additional layer of abstraction affords us more flexibility. The DGP may model drawing from a large group, but it doesn't have to. I explained previously that sometimes we are interested in the properties of a repeated process. For example, a woman may become pregnant and make behavioral choices that then have an impact on the health of the newborn baby. It is very implausible to think of such a process as belonging to a large but finite group. Every time a baby is conceived, a new and completely unique process is initiated. Many instances of the process have started and run their course in the past. However, many, many more will follow in the future. When we say we want to discover general rules for this process, we want those rules to be applicable also for future pregnancies. The large but finite group of past pregnancies is of no interest to us. Fortunately, our new definition of a population based on random variables covers repeated processes. Let y, x1 and x2 be random variables. These variables describe properties of a random pregnancy. y gives the weight of the baby at birth, x1 gives the average alcohol consumption of the mother during the pregnancy, and x2 gives the average cigarette consumption. The collection y, x1, x2 is the DGP or population that we want to investigate.
To sample from this DGP, we have to be able to randomly sample pregnancies. This means that we have to make sure that the probability that a certain kind of pregnancy ends up in our sample is equal to the frequency with which this kind of pregnancy occurs in real life. We learn about a population by looking at a sample from the population. Sampling once from the population is like taking one brief probabilistic peak at the population. To learn the rules of the population with precision, we ideally want to take more than one look at the population. In other words, we want to draw a sample of size greater than 1. We may draw 10 times from the population, or 100 times, or 1000 times. The size of the sample is denoted by n. We know that drawing once from the population replicates the population in a probabilistic sense. Therefore, if the population is described by random variables y, x1 and x2, so is a single draw from the population. Since we want to draw several times from the population, we need additional notation to distinguish between draws. For the first draw, we add subscript 1 to the random variables. For the second draw, we add a subscript 2. And so on. We continue up to the nth draw. This gives us a long list of random variables. This list is called the random sample. The first draw is called the first observation, the second draw is called the second observation, and so on. Clearly, writing down this long list can be quite tedious. To make life easier for us, we can use shorter notation. The subscript that is counting the number of the observation runs from 1 to n. A shorter way of writing down the random sample is by replacing the subscript by a placeholder i that we take from 1 to n. A random sample is described by a collection of random variables. Clearly, this is a random quantity. In the future, the uncertainty about who we draw is resolved and we see the realized sample. The realized sample is described by the realizations of the random variables. The realizations are numbers. Following our convention, we denote them by lowercase letters. These many numbers that describe the realized sample are sometimes called a data set. Statistical methods are rules for processing numbers in a data set. In a computer, we can represent a data set, for example, in an Excel file. Here I have opened an Excel spreadsheet with student data. Every row in the spreadsheet represents one observation. Every column represents one observed variable. The first observed student has achieved 40 points on the exam, has studied for 17 hours and has taken no previous statistics courses. When we apply statistical methods, we always work with data that is, we work with the realized sample. Why then do we need this complicated notion of a random sample that is represented by random variables? Think of the random sample as a metaphor for how we collect our data. Collecting our data by drawing a random sample ties our data to the population. This link ensures that by applying statistical methods to the data in our dataset, we can actually learn something about the population. Let's summarize what we learned about the population and the random sample. We are studying a population. The population could be a very large group of individuals or firms or countries, or it could be a repeated process for which we want to uncover persistent rules. We are interested in a set of features of the population that can be described by numbers using random variables. Everything about the population that is not captured by these random variables is irrelevant for us and we will ignore it. In fact, we will often say that the random variables are the population when we discuss statistical inference. You should keep in mind that there are two different notions of what constitutes a population. A random sample is a mathematical metaphor for how we collect data from our population. It encapsulates the notion that we pick data points randomly. An outcome of the random process of selecting a sample 
is called a realized sample. A realized sample is a collection of numbers and is also called a data set. We use statistical methods to process data in a data set. The statistical methods give us answers to our questions about the population. You may have noticed that I put the concepts realized sample and statistical methods in oval shaped frames. The realized sample and statistical methods are things that we can see in real life. We can look at the numbers in a data set and we can determine the rules that our statistical methods follow. The concepts that I put in boxes, that is the population and the random sample, are less concrete. We never do actually encounter them in real life. You should think of them as mathematical metaphors that we use to organize our thoughts about the object that we are studying and the way that we get at least partial information about its behavior.